Hey everybody, how you doing? I'm liking sideways, but I can't do the spin as well as I used to. You know, hey, it's a rough day, man. It's a rough day with the Russia and Ukraine thing. I don't want to speculate. I don't want to speculate, but anyway, oh, my glasses. Well, let's have a few minutes of uh, taking our mind away from it, eh? And I hope that uh, cooler heads prevail on all this. Anyway, so it's I don't know why these things happen to me. And I hate to use the word blessed. Because it makes it sound like, you know, there's this guy in heaven picking sides, winners and losers. You know, that's why I hate the word blessed. I can't stand it. When there's so much suffering, we got, like, we're on the verge of some crazy war, maybe. Uh... And we got we got a God, you know, and we, well, I, I feel so blessed uh, that God helped me play the bass the other night or the guitar. My gosh, come on. Just, it wasn't that. But I do feel fortunate because I have Deborah Bonham, John Bonham's sister, on the show today, Musicians on Couches. Man, okay, we all know John Bonham. I'm a drummer. Uh, he is rock royalty. He is a legend among legends. You know, uh, Phil Collins is a legend, but if you ask Phil Collins who he thinks a legend is, he'd say John Bonham. And his sister Deborah, they've got an album coming out on April 29th called uh, Bonham and Bullock. Uh, that's her, you know what, I'm not sure. I think it's her husband. It might be her, her boyfriend. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, Deborah. Uh, but Bonham and Bullock, uh, Peter Bullock and Deborah Bonham, uh, they're going to talk about their career. She's going to talk about uh, John and her time with John. Uh, you, if you're a John Bonham fan, if you're a Bonham fan, if you're a blues fan, if you're a rock fan, if you're a British rock fan, you need to watch this show. It's a long interview. Uh, I haven't edited it yet. I do these things in all sorts of, you know, uh, orders. Um, I, the conversation was so good, I just may leave it. So uh, enjoy it. Uh, sit back. Um, I don't know how this is going to turn out because I haven't done it yet. Uh, but it's about, about an hour and a half, but it was a really good conversation. I just may leave it. I just may leave it and do some other clips. Anyway, here we go. Musicians on Couches Drinking Coffee presents Deborah Bonham.
There you go. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, now I got you. Now you're there. Yeah, good. Yeah, Sorry, good. Glenn. I'm How still just doing? trying to... I'm good, thank you. I'm trying to learn these uh, yeah, Zooms yeah, and everything. It's, it's a new... I'm, a, I'm an old dog myself, and I had to learn a whole bunch of new tricks because of COVID, you know, I didn't play much over the course of the past year. So I did something else. I started this show, and welcome to uh, Musicians on Couches Drinking Coffee. So well, I, I'm on the couch. I'm just waiting for somebody to bring me a coffee. I don't think it's gonna happen. <laughs> and you're in good company. We've had people like Mark Farner from Grand Funk and Carmine Apiece, who played with Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page, you know, that great yeah. Fun. No, I know Carmine well. Yeah, yeah. And Carmine's been on the show and Sandy uh Sandy Gennaro, who played drums for the monkeys for 20 years. So we had all yeah. sorts wow. of people on the show. And recently, Felix Cavalieri, who was the uh Keyboard player for the uh, Young Rascals. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, how oh, short and all those sixty oh, hits. Yeah, yeah. So I'm we have local people on that too. Anyway, I'm glad to have you on. Well, uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it well, you know, it's, it's still kind of a year and a half of a new channel, but it's growing kind of quick. So we, uh, you know, we sell our sweatshirts and our t-shirts and all that kind of stuff. And and uh, oh, all right, so let's let's get right into this here. Um, so you're in the UK right now, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Like that, London, I, London I live here. Or so. where? London Sorry? Proper. London proper or where, where are you actually in the UK? No, um, at the moment I'm in the Midlands um, where, yeah. I, where I grew up. Um, so um, I'm up here at the moment, but we live on the South Coast. Oh, um, right. So um, not, I mean, about an hour and a half from London, something like that. So, is, yeah, uh, I'm in Michigan, which is. Uh, I know Michigan is your 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 area, that's for sure. But, and I <laughs> got hit by the, the pandemic for sure for, for musicians, that's for sure. Um, so, you know, this, you know, being on the sofa, is it OK to have the dog? She's joined yeah, in on sure, the sure, as long as she doesn't get in the way of you, of your face. <laughs> no, she wants to get in on the musicians on the couch. Oh, so she's, decided, yeah. she's decided it's dog time on the, on the, no, on the it, couch. It could be, it could be. Well, I have a, uh, this is my producer. This is Walt. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and here's a joke. beautiful. Yeah, here's a joke I say every show. This is my producer, and I'll tell you the truth. He does the bare minimum. That's enough for that. Uh, very good. Very <laughs> <Yeah>. good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm a <laughs> writer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so I mean, I'm a I'm a drummer of 40 years, and I've toured with Dick Wagner from Alice Cooper and a whole bunch of people. So I would be amiss if I didn't ask you a little bit. We'll, we'll, oh, there's your. I, and you know what? I didn't. I'm, getting, even, I'm getting coffee. Can you believe this? That's great. That's great. I actually had some tea brewing. I didn't even do. You no, you're going to pour it over me. Go away. Uh -oh. <laughs> Here we go. Cheers. Okay, cheers. 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 Here's cheers. my coffee. <laughs> and you're Peter, right? Yeah. Hi there, Glenn. Oh, God, Sorry. it's cold coffee. Yeah, it's it's just a prop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so no, I, anyway, I, yeah. So I drumming. Want the, I want to talk about the new album and all that, but I, I would be remiss and all my drumming fans would be upset if we didn't spend a little time on yeah, Very Famous sure. Brother. Yeah, uh, and and I read somewhere. I read. I did some. I do a little bit of research. Well, my producer does. So <laughs> only the bare minimum, though. Yeah. yeah. And that you were about <laughs> you were about six years old when uh, Zeppelin formed or Led Zeppelin. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's talk about your family dynamic growing up. I mean, that's. Uh, I mean, you and I've listened to some of your tunes, and and I mean, it's a musical family. And so uh, you know, you've got. So were your parents like? into that did, did did john and you have the, the same mom and dad or was it was, was oh yeah 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 there was uh mm -hmm. three of us there was john um uh who was 14 years older than me and then my brother michael uh who, who was 12 years older so they grew up you know two years apart i was the kid sister um unfortunately both of them have passed away which is um yeah but there you I go um, yeah um but yeah mom mom and dad um both loved music um so they were into the uh you know the big bands that, um uh you know and so that's where john got his love of, of drums from with uh 
Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And Sandy Nelson, you know, when John just used to play Sandy Nelson over and over again, let, let there be drums, you know, it was just co completely, he just yeah. loved it. And well, that was my mom and dad, you know. So, um, and they and they also loved um, a lot of the old uh, old blues artists like Billie Holiday and um, mm. uh, Sarah Vaughan and things like that. So they were always playing music. So I guess that's where it sort of started. And then John and Michael got into their music, and you know, from the Beatles, and then when mom took them to see the Beatles when they, when John was 14, I think. Oh, like oh 12. wow. wow. Um, What's the yeah, so, you know, we always had music playing and then, of course, the boys got into their music after that John saw the Beatles. He was just, that's it. That's what he was going to do. I mean, he was playing... There's, there's, like a, there's, excuse me, there's like a hand or something on the... the ah, it, it's me trying to hold... It's me trying sorry. to hold this. Okay. So go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, uh... Can you see me okay? You yeah, I see me? okay now. There was just something blocking half your face, and that would be bad for the for the Zoom people. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm coming to terms with it. I'm trying to do this on a phone. I don't know why we haven't got it on the laptop, but there you go. I think we've got, we've got to get tech savvy, you know. Oh, oh but, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I have my phone right here for emergencies, but but the laptop has become my survival, you know. Yeah, here, so. absolutely. So, so, um, so yeah, so, um, so after mom took them to see the Beatles, I mean, John was playing drums, playing pots and pans from before he could walk. So he was always, you know, drumming. But as soon as he saw the Beatles, that, that was it. He was, he was away. That was, he, he was going to be, he was going to play drums, you know, he was going to be a professional. Um, and so all of that music, he got into everything. He got into the Motown and, um, you know all the soul music, great all, all the great soul stuff that the uh, like uh, Clive Stubblefield as well. You know uh, James Brown. Right, 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 drummer. right. He, he loved all of that. So I was always hearing all of this music, and my other brother was into everything. They were they were into all Hendrix, and that would be always playing and everything. You know, so yeah. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the jazz because Carmine, when we we were talking and we talked a little bit about your brother how as him being one of the most influential rock drummers in history and how yeah. and him were, were, were very good friends when they used to tour together and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I got to know Carmine. Yeah, yeah. And Zeppelin had had opened up for Vanilla Fudge with Carmine. Yeah. And then Carmine, we were talking about... about I saw that. I saw it. You saw Vanilla Fudge. They, they're one of my yeah. friends of all time. They are. I saw, I've still got the program, believe it or not. I saw Vanilla really? Fudge with Zeppelin... Um, in Birmingham, in, in the Midlands, where I am right now, um, at the at the Birmingham Odeon, I think it was. Yeah, now I saw Vanilla Fudge when I was really young. They were fantastic. Because in John's playing, especially in the licks he would do, you really hear the Krupa, the Max. Yeah. He played them a little heavier and, and on the Tom Toms, but, but the, the rhythms that he was doing were right out of the jazz idiom. Some of the rock people didn't recognize it, but me, you know, I, I cut my teeth uh, on Miles Davis. That's where I started. Yeah, like getting really go. turned on the jazz. And so, but you hear that 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 Max Roach and Gene Krupa influence so strongly in his playing. And now we know that it came from your parents playing the big band stuff around that. Absolutely, house. absolutely. Benny Goodman, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. So it, that's really where it all started, and John just was absolutely Gene Krupa crazy. He, 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 he thought Gene Krupa was just an amazing drummer. Um, and Buddy Rich too. And he, um, much later on, you know, when they got Zeppelin, uh, Zeppelin were at the height, uh, the, uh, the height of their, 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 their career. Um, they were playing somewhere over in the States and uh, Buddy Rich was opening up for, for them. And, oh, and John, wow. yeah, and John said was telling telling um, telling me that uh, he 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 watched him drum and he said Buddy played out of his skin with a real like attitude, you know. Right, and, right, uh, right. and as he came off stage, you know, John was just stood there thinking, "Oh God, I've got you know, I've got to go on and follow Buddy Rich." You know, and as he came off, Buddy Rich just looked at him and and, and just went. Yeah, follow that then, you know. <laughs> uh, 
and of course he had to, you know, and and, and of course he did, um, which was great. And then um, many, many years later, um, Buddy Rich did an interview on um, for a big TV show that we had here called Parkinson. And Parkinson was asking, um, it's a legend, uh, Michael Parkinson's show is legendary here in the UK. And Michael Parkinson was asking Buddy, you know, what do you think of today's drummers? This was in the in the 70s rather um and he just slated everyone he just said now they're all useless except <laughs> one except <laughs> one and he said oh, who's that and he said john bonham and i <laughs> thought you know and john was absolutely over the moon you know that that but buddy richard said this. so That's yeah funny. he loved but he loved buddy rich as well it, it's funny you were talking about the buddy rich attitude which uh so I, I, I make most of my living by a teaching at the moment. I, I have about 30 uh-huh. students. And actually, last night I was working with a, a young student. He's about, about 14 on when the levee breaks. We are going through that, too. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. I, I teach a lot of the, the, the bottom style, and, and that's for the, for the rock guys. But, uh, but I always get the kids. So I tease the kids while they're playing. And the rock stuff, I always go, okay, you got to give me a rock face. You gotta give me a rock face because rock and roll is an attitude. Rock face. Yeah, you gotta, yeah. Give, you gotta give you that. Yeah. But, they, but I always about when when they're listening to Buddy and I'm talking about some of those licks, Buddy had that attitude. You know, yes. hard hitting, just gonna bring it all. And and all to me, all the great drummers like your brother, uh, so many, even even drummers who are less technical, uh, just had the, like 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 a Ringo had that attitude of of we're bringing it. You know. Yeah. Oh my no. Uh, Ringo's drumming was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Always, I always thought he he. I mean, some of the stuff that he brought to the Beatles, I think is is part of their 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 sound. You know, I mean, I know other, what people. There's been jokes and stuff, but no, I think Ringo Ringo Starr is a uh, yeah yeah very uh, fine drummer. On, on this channel, we call him the greatest song drummer that ever lived. I mean, he played the song better than anybody. There you go. Just, there I mean, you go. The parts and, and we talk about that a lot about, about uh, the when what I like about um, British rock people is you guys really organize parts to the music like <laughs> it's less of a jamming thing but but Phil from Phil Collins there are so many uh, iconic parts like even for Ringo for Come Together you can't play that song without doing that kind of drum thing exactly it's a song. Phil Collins, uh-huh. same thing with, with guitar licks. There are so many parts. And I really, I grew up, I know my American brethren will hate me, but I grew up like listening to Beatles, Zeppelin, The Who. Like, I don't think I discovered American rock till I was like 30. <laughs> you know? Okay, okay. Well, we were, you know what? We were discovering American music here. Uh, it, it all came over from America, you know, that's where it all started. Right, right, right. <laughs> We got the blues from you guys and, you know, Motown and soul. It was all coming from you guys. So, oh, right, right. I, so as much as I, I you know, I, yeah, I'm with you. I, I, I grew up on, on all that music too, uh, you know, what, you, what you've said. But the, the American stuff was uh, phenomenal. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I was just going to, because, you know, America, all the, everybody's crazy. But America back then, of course, you know, Beatles and, and Zeppelin were all getting inspired by the, the, the black African-American music. Absolutely. That, that white America wasn't listening to. I know, we got it. And, and then the Brits brought it over. You know, brought, yeah. we just took this from you. you know? <laughs> <And then laughs> I know. The, you know, we always have a whole lot of love and some of those tunes are really just some warped James Brown tunes. That, that that's Yeah, what, well, I think, you know, you can, you can hear a lot of James Brown in Led Zeppelin. Yes, you know, yes, yes. It, you know the the there's a track on um, on uh, has the holy that's you know it's even got take it to the bridge you know yes yes <laughs> yes can anybody take it to the bridge yeah, yeah. Look, that's uh, that's the ocean is that the ocean or the crunch that's the, the crunch. crunch crunch yeah yes. I did a, I did a part of what I do in this channel we do some instruction and I did a video on that particular tune on that that really cool little John Bonham that's tune. Right on that is yeah fantastic. yeah great. Great stuff. So let's. Yeah. So when did you growing up in that environment? Uh, so then you were six when he joined Zep. So in Zep's yeah. heyday, you were in your teens when they were. Yeah. Really, so 
that does that inspire you to, to start singing or do you play guitar? Like how does this happen to you to become to join this club? Um seven years old. I seven. went to see right. Ze- I went to see Zeppelin. Um and it my world changed. It totally changed. It was just wow. <laughs> and I thought <laughs> I'm, I want to do that. I want to do that. But, they, you know, it was just, I think it was the hot, you know, the music, how it, how it affected me. Um, the whole thing, it was just this otherworldly sort of thing that was going on on this stage, you know, and this music just really, really affected me. And um, I just felt, yeah, I, w- I want to do that. And I've been trying ever since. It's not easy to, to try and be as good as Led Zeppelin. <laughs> I mean, I mean, no, they are. They, they're the top of the heat. You know, that's the, top. Uh, the bar was set pretty high, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. so I, I'm it. still jumping. I'm still trying to reach that. <laughs> <one>. <laughs> you know, what I always say about it, the thing I love about music, it's the mountain that you can't climb because there's always further to go. And that's, yeah, that's and, true. I, and I hope if there's anything that keeps you living longer, it's because every time you get up in the morning, you realize Oh, I got to learn this thing. I got to learn that thing. Like, I'm, you're never done. There's always something you got to learn in music. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was it. That was the, the moment that really, you know, I wanted to, I just, it, that was it. I wanted to be in some form uh, right. music. But, but I always sang. So, um, and I sang at school, but I, I stayed on at school till I was 18. So, you know, um, I, I didn't really start doing much musically in this sphere. In, you know, uh, uh, I didn't really start until after that. So John had passed away by then. Um, oh, all right. And he, I, you know, I, I remember t- talking to him about it when I was about 16. Um, and I'd just done what we call O-levels here. And, and I, you know, I did quite well at school and, um, he really thought that the, the music industry wasn't the place for his kid sister, you know. Um, right. And he he just wanted me to be a vet or a, or a lawyer or something, you know. And he says, no, no, stay at school. He was very protective. And I, I now totally understand why, because back then, you know, he, he saw a side of the music industry that you know women women had a tough time in it and he saw that and and that that's now of course opened up it's it's no longer like that but back in the day it wasn't easy for 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 girls to break through or women to 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 get going and the trailblazers that that did you know i mean you you can talk about all those great female vocalists and uh, that that i mentioned like like billy um billy holiday um, and, and we had Dusty Springfield and, and you know, and then, we had, of course, Janis Joplin and, and uh, Christine McVie and, and Stevie Nicks. And they were all they were all trailblazers. And it, it wasn't right. an easy ride for any of them, you know, um, because it was predominantly a man's world, especially rock music. Very sure. much so. Sure. Um, and so, I, you know, I got it and, I, and he saw a side to it that he just thought, I don't think you should be in that. And I guess, you know, with, with the things that went on in those, in those days, you know, um, we lost, we lost uh, Janice and, and um, I think he just thought, no, you shouldn't be doing that. So I stayed on at school. Um, but you know, your heart has to go where your heart has to go. And it, it's, right. it's just all in, in me that I, I wanted to write songs and sing, you know, um, I love, I love playing drums, although, um, I, I never got it. I, I've never really done it, but sometimes I just have to sit down and watch them and it's a great <laughs> feeling. And then I try and do something really clever because I've got all the rhythms that John would do in, in, in my head. And, and I go to do, I'm thinking, yeah, it's going to be easy. I can do that. And, oh, dear. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I so I, I, I just, I don't touch the drums. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I teach. I, a lot of people come on, sometimes older older people come on and they think it's going to be really easy. And then they find out, oh, this is a lot. Oh. Of thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, for, Max Rose used to say, we're uh, simultaneous multi-percussion engineers. 
Four lists. Yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah. uh, my throat's saying. So, so I saw that you ended up doing some work with Jason early on. Yeah, so, well, um, when I, I, I'd written a couple of songs and uh, it was my first time of having a go at, at you know, singing. So I called um, Robert Plant, who Robert's pretty much like a brother to me. So, you know, he, and he had, back, in, back then there wasn't all the technology that we have now. It was, um, you know, tape. You recorded onto tape and he had a, a small studio uh, in his barn at home. So I said, can I come over and have a go? I want to see if I if I can sing and if I, you know, if this song's any good. And, you know, he said, yeah, sure, come over. We'll we'll do something. And the guy who recorded us was a guy called um, Benji Lefebvre. And Benji was the sound front of house sound engineer for Led Zeppelin. Um and, a, you know, an amazing sound engineer, but he also uh, recorded all of Robert's solo stuff. Um, so he said, yeah, no, I'll come and record it for you. Let's see, see what you got, you know. So I said to Jason, do you want to come and just play the drums? Because Jason's been playing the drums since he was, you know, in nappies, really. Um, and he said, yeah, I'll come and play. And he was about, I think he must have been about 15 and I was eight, 15, 16. 18 or 14 and, and 18 something around that there's about three or four years difference between us um so jason came over and uh he you know he was playing drums then incredibly you know um oh, yeah. even, even back then he was pretty formidable and um we started recording and played that this song and everything we went and had a listen and it was you know it was <laughs> it was good and um, all of a sudden, Benji said, hey, what? I, I can hear some rustling noise on this. What, what on earth is this sound coming from, you know? Anyway, couldn't figure out what it was. And he realized it was on a drum mic. And what had happened, Jason had played the whole track with one hand while his other hand was eating. <laughs> he got some crisps and sweets by the side of his, oh. his <laughs> by the side of his drum and he was just eating his Christmas sweets while trying while playing playing with one hand you know oh and the rustling of the bags was coming across on the uh, on the on the recordings so it was yeah he was oh he was a case he was very funny so that's I, where I watched, we had we started I watched a lot of uh, Jason's clips when he was with uh, John Bonamassa oh yeah 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 Jason's a really good player, really good player, and he. he yeah, he's fantastic. He be, yeah. he then played um, the uh, all the drums on my al old Hyde album. He played all the all the tracks bar one. Did he did he play on the year? I think your first album was for you and the moon. Oh yeah, no, I I don't I, for you and the moon. I, it's not me. I, I think that oh. was I think it was somebody impersonating me. Oh really. <laughs> It's, no. it's listed under you. <laughs> no, it's it, it's me. I just had nothing to do with it. You know, it was a. Oh. I got signed. I got signed up um, by Career Records, which was, which was fantastic, um, because I sent out some anonymous demos. These these demos that I'd been doing at at, at Robert's place, and um, I sent them out anonymously, and I got this deal with Career Records. But then, you know, of course, the John bit came out, and. But um, they, uh, it, it just, it, they put me with, with a producer over in uh, Germany and I went there to record the album, which was great fun. I mean, it was brilliant, but the, I had nothing to do with the music and it was really, it became very sort of 80s rock, very sort oh, of, you know. It didn't have the soul and the blues feel that has always been in me, or, or even a bit of folky. I quite like uh, English folk and and, and yeah. West Coast. But I'm a big Joni Mitchell fan, you know. Um, 
So it didn't have any of those qualities. It, it just became a bit s- sterile almost, you know. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't claim too much for that that record but it got great it got great reviews and it did well you know yeah, so I guess I guess um you know the record company knew what they were doing it's just that you know when you do music you, you've really got it it's got to come from your soul and and if it's not coming from there then and if it, you're trying to you know do something that really isn't in you it, it, it I, what's the point you know so, um, so I went my own way after that, and, and just did the stuff that I wanted to do, you know. Well, I uh, I watched a bunch of your your clips, and uh, I I really thought the sound is somewhere between, and I hate to, to pigeonhole because everybody's original, but but if if I were to put somewhere between Heart and Zeppelin, that's where you guys are, you know, <laughs> so, kind of in between that, because you definitely have some even in in the uh, the rock stuff. There's definitely some folk aspects to the uh to what you're doing even right now and yes uh, but then but then you you sort of morph your you have a little folk air section and then it morphs into a much heavier kind of yeah. thing you know and that's really cool which reminded me of some of the stuff that Hart had done where they would do that kind of folk uh, yeah very much so well you know dreamboat annie was one of my favorite albums so you know um and i'm a big uh Anne and, and Nancy fan, you know, I, I just think that they, they were trailblazers too, you know. Uh, and and there were the two females in, in the music business at that time who who I mean I'm a very well aware in almost every industry the females have always had a rough time of it. You know, I mean oh my God in America we only gave them the right to vote like you know less than a hundred years ago. I mean about yeah. years ago. So it's ridiculous that we people are treated that way. But I understand why John was protective of you. and kind Yeah, of- absolutely. So do I. Yeah. It's not for the faint of heart. This business is tough. No, it, it's been a rough road. I, you know, I don't mind saying it. This has not been an easy choice, uh, an easy road, uh, an easy road to travel. And, and as far as I chose something that I, I didn't t- choose it because I thought it was going to be easy. I, I pretty much knew it wasn't. And uh, not only... Well, do you face those, did I, me and many others of my generation face that uh, difficulty being female? But um, I also had the added uh, Zeppelin tag, which can be a double-edged sword, you know, right. because even though I am hugely proud and it, for me, it's they're just one of the most incredible bands ever of all time. Um you know, it, it, it's a big thing to carry. And, and then people would instantly write you off because, oh, you know, uh, oh, yes, another one, jumping on the back of the name or whatever. And it was never, never, ever like that. You know, it, uh, it's not something that I've, I've done. I did keep my name because there was no point changing it because it would always come out. So it, right, right, right. And if I can't, do the, the, you know, I needed to do the name proud. I've got no rights being in this industry if I couldn't do john proud you know you know go go do another job you know but uh so i decided to keep the name but um it's been a a a double-edged sword that i think now at this age now and now that i've established myself um it's it's far much easier now but it it, it's been a hard road it's not been it it isn't for the faint-hearted you're right you know but it's great it's been a great, it's been a great trip. It really has the whole, the whole thing, you know, good and bad. It's been an amazing trip so far uh, and still I a lot more to hope. Across the board, you know, the music business, even financially is pretty much like that. You know, I've had times yeah. where I was touring with national acts and like I said, Dick Wagner, who played with Alice Cooper and Kiss, yeah. and all these guys. And, uh, and you had tons of money. And then sometimes when, how am I going to eat today? You know, <laughs> like, I mean, both are, are true. By the way, you know, to get ready for this interview and get uh, inspired because on, on uh, during the pandemic, I took some of the stimulus money there and I bought myself a new turntable. And I have a, yeah. a high end turntable. And to get ready for this interview, I just finished listening to Zeppelin 4. You know, so oh. really cranking here in the house. So, uh, and, one of my and it, still, it still sounds as great today, doesn't it? 
you know, it does. It's a fantastic the, the production album. on that, the production and the sound, it's still, you know, uh, I put it on, I put all those albums on and I, I marvel at how great that production is. You know, are you, they are still, you still close with the guys. Are you still close with the guys? Oh yeah, 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 very much so. I'm very, very close to Robert. Um, as I say, he's he's like a, a brother to me. But I'm also, you know, I I speak regularly, or it, you know, I, not regularly, regularly. But I I speak to Jimmy and I see Jimmy. I don't see John Paul Jones so much, but um, you know, when I do, it's always great. Um, but yeah, no, I was, I was with Robert last night. So we had a, we went to the football together, so it was great. <laughs> oh, great, great! That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So yeah. let's fast forward a little bit. And I was watching this uh, Paul Rogers connection. I watched some of those clips. Yeah. But had you known Paul Rogers prior to that when you guys started sort of touring together? And I take my seat on the train. How that how that came about? I mean, he was a, a, a big friend of John's, um, so John obviously, you know, they knew each other really, really well. But I, I didn't know him at all. Um, I met him once, you know, in the seventies. I think when I was, a, you know, I was a young girl. He was at the John's house, um, but uh, uh, somebody I, we knew said that Paul was touring. Um, and he knew who the uh, the agent was, and he called up to to see if they wanted a, a support act. And um, we we got the gig, but Paul didn't know. Um, so we got the the support act, and we went and uh, supported Paul. Um, and I, I think we did three shows before I met him. And he came. To, he came and watched the show. He was at the side of the stage. And when I came off, he said. Why haven't you been to meet me? And I said, because I, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't think I should. <laughs> um, and that was the start of it. And we we became great, great friends. And he absolutely loved Pete's guitar playing. Oh. So we became real close friends. And his wife Cynthia is uh, she she was Miss Canada. She so, but she's as beautiful inside as she is on the outside. You know, she's just she's just one of the world's angels you know and she res she loves animals and, and very very involved with animal rescue and you know charities they, they they're very into their charities um and of course i rescue animals and so they she her and i just instantly clicked and we all became great friends and then we she came on board and he came on board as well as patrons of a charity that i had that rescued ex race horses and we decided to do a musical event uh you know like a concert to raise money and paul said yeah no i'll, I'll come and i'll come and do that with you um I, can i use your band and i was like yeah well of course <laughs> yeah. um and that was it and they started playing uh they, they came over and and paul went in the studio uh, in our rehearsal studio at our home um just to see if it worked, you know, and they hit it off and they did all the free, they, they called it the free spirit tour. Yeah. I, I love that name, by the way, as you know, yeah. homage to the original free, which was very cool. Very yeah. Cool. Well, at the charity gig, he, that's what he wanted to do. He did it. I, I think he did a couple of bad company songs, but he wanted to do the free stuff because he, he, he loved Pete's guitar playing because Pete's hero was Paul Kossoff, uh, right. one of his um along with Rory Gallagher and you know uh he so um Paul wanted to he just loved Pete's guitar playing so they, we did the charity show and it went that well we did a couple of them and then Paul said you know what why don't we just take this out on the road so um so we did you know and the guys uh, I I opened up 
and then the guys played with um, with Paul, and it was fantastic. We did the Free Spirit in in the UK, and then of course we came out to America in 2018 uh, with the same similar similar show. He added a few more Bad Company songs in. Oh. We came out with um, Jeff Beck and Anne Wilson. Um, wow. Yeah, so it was fantastic. We did, we did the whole of America, and it was just amazing. But Anne went on after me, so every night I had to sing in front of Anne Wilson because she'd be at the side of the stage watching. <laughs> I, I could hardly even talk to her. I was such a dork, honestly. I, I, I come off the stage and I go, oh, hello, Anne, in this stupid voice because I just couldn't believe Anne Wilson was stood there watching me sing, you know. Wow, it was great. It was really, really good. You know, as a little, so little side note and plug, about, about two months ago, we had on this show um, Mike DeRosia and Steve Fawson, who were the bass player and drummer for the original Heart. They were on Dreamboat Annie, and they were on Barracuda and Crazy on You. Oh, yeah. Okay, that drummer, so, he liked and I, John. And I had both of them for an interview. So so they've been on the show, too. So. Yeah, well, he, he, I tell you what, that, Barracuda has got a very sort of hint of John on it, on those drums. And we, we talked about that, that, that the beat he plays on that is right out of the, the bottom playbook, right yeah. out of that thing. So uh, oh, that's great. Great song. Oh, she did, it, she, she did it on this tour. And every night I was, you know, I had to keep reminding myself not to be out front singing my head off because I've got to sing the next day. You know? right, right, <laughs> but I kept right. going out there and as soon as she started it, I was like, yeah, come on. It was <laughs> yeah. brilliant. So that's great. Uh, Ann Wilson and uh, who else was on tour with you? Jeff Beck. Jeff Beck. Uh, he's one of my heroes. He's one of my heroes. And yeah, that that was something for Pete, you know, because Pete then had to had to go on stage after Jeff Beck. So um, because they alternated the headline between Jeff and Paul Rogers. So um, one night Pete would go on before with Paul Rogers and then the next night he'd go on after Jeff Beck. And every night, Pete was like, God, "I've got to go. I've got to play. I've got to go on after Jeff Beck. You know, how, how do you how do you follow that? You know." But Very he did. Good. He did. So let's talk a little bit about the, about the new album, which I'm told is being released on the 29th of April. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, on Quarter Valley Records. Yeah. And, and what's the, the title? Is it is the, is the name of the band Bonham Bullock? Is that what? The yeah. Is? Yeah, it's just Bonham Bullock. So let's talk about the songwriting. Do you and Pete? collaborate on songwriting is it all together or is it a we do no, no I, I usually come up with the ideas um and and the chords and this that and the other and then I give it to the band and they they put their take on it and that's happened with um all our other albums but this one is actually other people's songs this is a, a covers album oh all um, right yeah we 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 picked um I, I wanted to we, we I just wanted to do a, a new project really you know people have over the years have kept going on to me about you know you really should do a blues covers album um and I never felt ready or that I wanted to really go all the way down that road I don't want to just do straight uh famous blues covers I didn't want to do that so this is very much um our take on some very obscure songs and some um there's a couple of, uh, uh, you know, there's an Albert King one in there. Um, but we've done our own take on it. So it's blues, it, rock. It's almost got, got a bit of prog rock in it as well. <laughs> so oh, wow. It's, um, but it's, it's, it's all based at the blues. You know, that's where it's at. And some of it is very much, I, I mean, for me, blues is, a, is an emotion. It's, right, a, it's right. a feeling that's, uh, you know, and we've tried to be as respectful as we possibly can to the to the greats that have written some of these songs that we've done um and uh but put our own take on it because there's no point you know just doing a cover uh, the, the same because it's already been done right. brilliant so you've got to you know i grew up listening to joe cocker who you know defined do, doing a cover when he did little help for my friends you know which was ringo's song right right and if you listen to Ringo's song and then you see what Joe Cocker did he took it and he completely changed it into this I, I love the Joe Cocker version oh man it is I mean it's just uh, it, 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 it 
blows me away every time I hear it. It's just so cool. And that's what, for me, is that defines, um, you know, covering somebody else's song, that you really need to take the sentiment of their song, but you've, you've got to make it your own. Otherwise, right. there's no point, you know. They've, al they've already done it their way, and, and you've got to pay respect to that and, and, and do the best version that you, you, you can do, you know. But, yeah, so that's what we've done. And it, it's, it was a challenge. Does that kind of be so? Uh, a little while ago, uh, pre-COVID, I had a Beatles tribute band I did, and uh, and I I write and arrange and all that stuff. So I would get on piano and I would, but we didn't do same like you. We did not do the Beatles music. It was a different kind of tribute band. We did not do it like the record. First of all, they had a lot of strings and all sorts of stuff, and I had five guys. So uh, yeah, there you go. Work, right. So I, we would, and we came up like with a version of Eleanor Rigby that was like punk rock, you know. And, 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 and there were people that really dug it and said, this is like the best version of that song I've ever heard. But so I would do almost all the writing and arranging for that, but I would sit home at home on the piano and I'd try to find something. Oh, that's an idea. Let me try that. And then I would kind of bring it to the guys. How did you guys, did you guys jam on stuff and come up with an idea? Was it yeah, your I, ideas or how did it work? Yeah. Well, it's the first record I've completely produced on my own. And, oh, you know, right. it, <laughs> it was a massive challenge, a massive challenge, but I loved it. Once I got into it, after I got rid of the nerves, I, I think I just kept thinking, oh, I've got to get this so right, you know, because these are great songs. These are, you know, from some amazing artists um, and I've got to get it right. And if I get it wrong and I get, you know, I, and I got myself right. all in, into a bit of a fret about it, you know. Um, and once I'd settled into it, we as we got together and, and tried the songs out and it was like no you know what that's not going to work because it's too like the original so we had to think outside the box uh, right. you know and really dig deep into finding what worked and, and what I felt comfortable with and and, and how, how I was going to sing it you know um and uh yeah we we all had input but I guess um at the end of the day it was I, it was predominantly me, I guess. Um, Pete calls me a control freak. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're. I'm you know, at the end. I, I'm, I'm one of those guys who've done a little bit of everything. I did even Carnival Cruise Lines for eight years. So I mean, you know, I've been everywhere. And I was a music director. So at the end of the at the end of the day, you know, my name would go on the door. So yeah, I, yeah, you know, I, it has to be something I th I thought was going to work. And and you know, you try to be democratic about it. At the same time, you know. I say, well, you if, if if definitely when you're doing something like this, if if everybody starts input, you, you, if, you've got to have one producer because if right. everybody starts putting every bit in, it all starts getting a bit messy. But it all it was always open for people to come up with ideas, and and everybody did, you know. That but I've worked, we've been in this band for a long, long time. We've worked together for thirty years, Pete and I. So we we second. It's second nature to us. I know where he's going to go and I know what he's thinking right. and he does that with me, you know. So it's it's a given that what he comes up with, I, I, I pretty much know that that's what I'm going to want. So, and then the other guys, um, keyboard player, bass player, same same deal. We've been together so many, so many years, you know. Um, so everybody had their, you know, did, did their bit. Um, it was just left... To me to really choose which bits worked and which bits didn't you know um but it was great it was a it was a challenge it was it, you know we really had to dig deep um right. on this record but it was just great and then once i finished it i was really um i wanted it a certain sound and and a, and a mix what we what we were mixing wasn't quite working for me and then that was um, Robert again that's, that said to me, why don't you try calling Tim Oliver? Now, Tim Oliver uh, works at uh, Peter Gabriel's studio at uh, Real World. Right. Good. And um, he said, I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll call him for you. Because Tim, Tim's very particular on, on you know, they, they're, they're, quite, they're more world music and um, he's, they're quite particular on who they work with, you know. Um, anyway, Tim, Tim loved it and said, yeah, I'd love to do it. And it was fantastic. I was so pleased. What a, what a wonderful guy to work with. So that, that was great for me working with uh, somebody of his 
his uh, status, you know, well, just how not status, how great he is, his talent as a, as a mixing mastering engineer, just phenomenal. So it was great. And it was great, great going over. Lots of good people coming together then, then for this project. Lots of really Yeah, it was really, really good. And um, we, we did it remotely. You know, we had to do it via internet. So I was having to listen to everything he was sending me and saying, you know, at one second, at one minute, 27 seconds, can you just raise that bit or take that hi-hat yeah. down a bit? You know, it was all that going on because we couldn't, because of the pandemic, we couldn't right. get together. Um, so that was a challenge as well but then we had one day where the restrictions got lifted and tim said do you want to come over and we were like absolutely so we went over to real world and it was oh it was just great it was just such good fun um and it was yeah he did a great job so very 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 pleased with that well the uk has lifted restrictions now right there's no more restrictions in the uk yeah no more restrictions and we start touring uh we start playing uh, in April 6th is our first show. We, we've done two already. We, we did two um, indoor fe big festivals in January. And honestly, it was like the band, it was like we were all being released out of cages or something. Oh, yeah. Because we got on that stage and it was just burning, you know, it was really, and all the people there that it was packed out. Um, it was about three or 4,000 people. And uh, everybody was, you could tell people had been locked up, you know, everybody was just having a ball. So it was, it was brilliant to be back. Uh, you know, I, I can't wait. I got a couple of shows coming up. I got one in Indianapolis and one in Nashville and then and about the next four weeks. And it's like, I really haven't, I did one show in December and things are starting to open up again here, but we haven't really uh, opened up all the restrictions yet. No, that's why we, that's why we can't, we, we were planning, you see, the album was supposed to come out in, in 2020, but of course, once the pandemic hit, that's that put pay to that. So that's why we've held it back till right. now. Um, we were really we were coming over to to the states um, 2020, 2021. Of course, that couldn't happen. Um, so now we're just waiting for to see how the restrictions start easing up into in America, and and hopefully, you know, by the end by the fall or the you know the end of this year will be over I'm, I'm, I'm sort of I, I feel quite confident that it's following a trend and I think you will it will start to ease up I think over there amen I can't wait I can't, I can't wait yeah nor me because we had I mean honestly the the audiences and, and the people over there we couldn't have had a, a, a lovelier time when we were over in the states and it you know, we really want to get there. So we've thought, well, we can't be in all places at, at the same time. Right. So let's 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 work where let's go and tour where we can at the moment. And then hopefully by the time we've done that, America will be open and we can come. So let's give a shout out to your band. Uh, what's the lineup? Who, who are you taking and, and what are they? Who's the guys? What are they playing and what, what's going on with that? Well, Pete, Pete, you should really come and say hello here. Yeah, say hello, Pete. You're the guitar player. Come on, Pete. Co-writer and ranger and... He's hiding. Here he uh -oh. is. Because he wants to go to the pub. You know that. That's what this is about. <laughs> he just want, you just want to get, get get to the pub, don't you? Yeah, yeah we're I mean, I, I, sitting on the sofa with a beer rather than a coffee. <laughs> I, I'm, gonna, I'm inviting him over so that he holds the phone because my arm is aching. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> hey! So and you're free. Free. So you're, you're, you're playing lead, and are you doing are you doing vocals with the band, or are you, what else were you doing? Uh, what well, lead? Yeah, you did some vocals. I, I, I do I do some backing vocals, but uh, on the album we we had a great backing singer, John Hogg. Oh yeah, right. who's there? Uh, and John John was in a band called Moke, and he's also in a band called the uh, Mike Pie Salute. Salute with uh, one of the Robinson brothers, you know, from the Black Crows. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, nice, great singer. Yeah, so jo John's a great, great, great songwriter singer. as well. I did some songwriting with him. Yeah. Really. Oh, yeah, on this previous album, yeah. Spirit album, John co-wrote two or three songs with us. Oh, right. But I'd, I'd actually known him since he was like a 13-year-old kid. His, his little uh, child band used to back us on a little Sunday lunchtime gig we used to do in the uh, 80s. Not so, me, you. <laughs> But you did you know, beat it I, on the I, I, I watched one of your like it was like a promo 
it was an hour long, like an interview video, but you had a lot of clips and you were talking about, I like that you're a jamming band because uh, I, I was telling you, you know, I'm a, I'm a drummer and I play all sorts of stuff, but, but uh, where they were talking about a song that you started and then morphed it into um, Purple Rain. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Well, and and I, talk- I looked all over the YouTube and the internet to find that and I can't find it anywhere. But I'd like I'll to send you the link. That, that you just oh, if you can send a clip of that, yeah, that's wonderful. Ooh. Was, uh, God, that was a, we actually arrived in France for a show the night before a gig, and uh, it was uh, we, we we saw on the television in the bar when we arrived that, uh, that this news of Prince, and of course we didn't we didn't really understand what they were saying because it was in French until Debbie sort of tuned in because she speaks French, you know, she's very clever, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, said, oh, Prince has died, and we were like, oh. oh. All we, we're, we're not necessarily the biggest Prince fans in the world, but I think everybody liked Prince a bit. It was almost a bit of a, you know, like when Elvis died. or you know, it, it, It's something big when Prince died, wasn't it? it was a, right, right, right. I think everybody felt it. Uh, so so we, we, we all just felt that we had to do something the next night at the show. And, and this part of a uh, song we do called No Angel, it goes into a, sort of a, a dynamically sort of quiet bit of a guitar solo thing and we take it right down and uh and we decided wonder if we could just squeeze purple rain in there and uh uh-huh. and 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 we managed to and it and it just took off in its own energy i don't, I don't know how we did it because we didn't rehearse it or anything it was just one of those last minute things on on the day of the gig yeah we sort of talked about it so so we the gig just go was into a, that so i don't know how we even did it it just happened absolutely organically it was amazing yeah <laughs> and then you know, the I, inter- I, I got your email from john and what i'll do is i'll, I'll send you something in my email so you can pop a clip of that in if you got it that'd be great to throw in the video. yeah absolutely so what's, the what's play- your lineup? you're playing lead guitar you got you got a rhythm player you got keys what do you got in this band yeah we got uh okay so we got the uh, uh well we got uh, our regular touring uh, keyboard player g lewis is with us on the, he's mainly doing the pianos and stuff and then we've had guest hammond players like uh paul brown from uh, the water boys and he's also oh, with yeah. ann Pete. paul brown and i played together for two years with dick wagner the- You're kidding. Ah! <laughs> yeah so, so you know so, brother paul. so tell tell paul brown i said hello so glenn has said hello yeah 
together and he remember me from Dick Wagner and we toured all over with Dick. Dick Pass it was Alice Cooper's, you might know Dick, he was Dick, Dick, uh, Alice Cooper's guitar player, played with Lou Reed. Uh, yeah, and, and, and we toured and Paul and I toured with him. We had not met each other until uh, that tour, but uh, so wow, what a crazy small world. Here we are. Well, well, you'll know what he'll say then when we tell him, he'll go, Man! Man! Yeah, That's yeah, all! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing and great, great guy, cool guy to tour with. And, and uh, so he's, he's, I, I missed it, but is he on the tour? He's not actually going on the tour? Or... No, no, he won't no. be on the tour with us. But uh, well, if, if he's, a, he is actually over in the UK with the Water Boys around the same time. All right. So he usually gets some time off on the Water Boys. Yeah, you won't stop him getting up. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he usually calls us to see if he can come and stay with us for a week or two while the Water Boys have a break. Saves him going back to America and back to the UK again. Right, right, right. right so right, if, right. That, if, if that falls in the time we're playing, we'll have him up there playing. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, if you, if you see him, tell him to say hi and he can come on uh, Musicians on Couches Drinking Coffee and we can talk about our time with dick wagner so. yeah but well you better get tea for paul he's a yeah. tea guy he's oh. a he's a fancy, fancy tea drinker he is he's one of life's beautiful people he is and he's such a talent such a talent on that on that almond he's fantastic he's fantastic yeah well, just on coffee we don't really care what you drink we just like the name we stole it from, we, we stole it from jerry seinfeld and that's really how it started i was bored in the pandemic i really lived bored and I was watching the Seinfeld show on YouTube, uh, Comedians in Cars Drinking Coffee. <laughs> that's really, and I thought, because I, I, you know, I've often on tour with a lot of national acts. Mark Farner, you know, from Grand Funk, he's been on the show. I toured with him and he's a friend. And I thought I should just do that with musicians. Call it Musicians yeah. Drinking Coffee. And then I said, well, that doesn't sound right. Let me call it Musicians on Couches Drinking Coffee. And that was it. That's how the whole thing started. So just, Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> We've got the vintage couch. <laughs> oh, all right. And you got the what's the dog's name? Babushka. Babushka. Yeah. Nice name. Yeah. And then we got another one there. Wow. Our rescue doggies. <laughs> so who's playing drums and bass for you on the tour? Well, we got uh, Rich Newman on drums. And uh, Rich has been with us for about 12 years. But before he was with us, he was um in the 80s, he was with Sam Brown. Did uh, did she have any hits over there? She was Joe Brown's daughter. Sam had a big hit with a song called Stop. Uh, I, I, don't know you do. I have to look it up. But, but, all right. Yeah, Sam Brown. There's a girl called Sam Brown, not, not a man. And then he joined Steve Marriott's band that were doing the, the club scene around the, the UK and Europe. And after that, he joined Rory Gallagher for the last five years of Rory Gallagher. Oh, all right. So, and then on top of that, um, a lot of American touring bands come over, like the Burrito Brothers and Jefferson and uh, the, the remainder of uh, Grateful Dead. And they do a show called Live Dead. Right. Well, our drummer, Rich, he does the drums for all those American bands when they come over to the UK. So he has, he has quite a repertoire, repertoire in his head that he has to pull out for all these different bands he plays with. <laughs> yeah, Please, uh, moonlighting. I tell him, I oh, you're yeah, off moonlighting. Yeah. So when does your, your <laughs> tour? When does the your your tour start in the UK? And I know you were saying you pushed it back, but is there anything on the schedule for the US for the fall or winter? Not not yet. Not, not yet. yet okay. but, but that's that's the that's the plan. That that is the plan at the moment. It might it, it might even get pushed into next spring, depending on what happens you know, with restrictions and, and things like that. So we just got to watch this space for a moment, I think. Um, but I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty confident it's going to open up. And yeah. I, I'm pretty, I mean, the bottom line is we, we've got to learn to live with this problem. Exactly. You know, exactly. It's not going to go away. Um, it's going to, but the, uh, hopefully it'll start to 
ease up, you know, and it'll become seasonal. Maybe I, I don't know, but I, I just, I hope for the best. I think we're through the worst. I do yeah, believe yeah, yeah. that. That's how I feel about it. I'm all vaccinated up. You know, every year I get a flu shot, so I'll get a flu shot and a COVID shot. There you go. And that would- there you go. Me, me right. too. I just think- right. I'll get a tequila shot. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Although, you know, I, I was telling Deborah that uh, I was on Carnival Cruise Lines for a while, so I've gotten to go around the world. And, uh, you know, UK pubs and the beer, that's a big thing over there. Beer is a big, big, big thing there. Big thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 where we are right now, they do their own. They've got one. Um, it's called the um, Y Y Valley Beer, and it's uh, they've got one called Sway, and I think it's called Sway for a reason because you have a pint of it and you you're pretty much sway. Well, two pints yeah, of sway. Yeah, six, six. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Look, you're a guitarist, rock. Uh, but I tell you what, in, in, in America on the, the American tour of three years ago. Uh, we um, on our days off, we, we had quite a few days off. We'd we'd just uh, park yeah, up the we'd uh, park up at the hotel. Yeah. Put your thumb in the camera. Yeah, yeah. We'd we'd park up the hotel and then just find an Irish bar or something like that in uh, whatever whatever city or time we were in. And uh, the beer selection is fantastic in American Eye. There's a lot of craft brewed beer in America. Yeah, there is. Yeah. A, lot, a, lot of, a lot of small we, breweries we were, now. We were really loving the beer there because I mean, in the nineties and stuff, it was a, it was all very lager based in the nineties, wasn't it? It was all very Bud Light yes, and stuff. Yes, like that. yes, yeah, yeah. But uh, although now, here we, we do more of the cold beer, and you guys like it a little warmer over there, right? You do more of the warm beer over there. I like it cold, yeah. So I, oh, I, right. so I, 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 I like I, it warm. I, I like the. Uh, <laughs> I like the American craft beers, the things like the Fat Tire and the. Uh, oh yes, so, yeah, I, lo- I love that beer. Yeah, and Shipyard. I remember in Barney's Beanery in L.A., first night we arrived there, there was about, I don't know, 10 of us or something like that, or maybe eight of us, and uh, we, we all ordered beers, and we just ordered the familiar names to us. It was, oh, somebody said, all right, yeah, yeah just uh, eight Heineken, Heinekens or something like that. And we got this huge bill anyway, you know, the, the, the night cost us about 200 bucks each in beer. Oh, wow. And then the, then the following night or the following afternoon, we went in and think, I don't remember America being this expensive. And we went in and had a look at the actual menu. And it was it was basically because we were drinking imported beer. I looked yeah. at the menu and it was like you could get a big jug with four pints of fat tire in it for half the price of the. So, of course, the next night we went in there and we, we had the same amount to drink for half the price. It was great. Right. <laughs> Right, that's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. There you go. That's a that's a top tip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That left more money for chicken wings, you see. Yeah. <laughs> you you and those chicken wings, honestly. Well, you know, and it's a. Uh, I'm well, trying to get him to eat tofu, but he's not having any of it. So yeah, well, I'm, I'll let her eat the uh, celery. <laughs> <laughs> So are you rehearsing for the tour or you've already rehearsed? You got the guys. We, we go no, we'll have, a, we'll have a rehearsal. We'll have a couple of rehearsals, yeah. but we don't. We'll have a discussion in the pub the night before and then rehearse at science. It, it always, honestly, that's what happens. I get the lads in there. They do one song and they go, right, we're going to the pub. I'm like, no, we're going to rehearse. No, nah, come on, it'll be fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But to be honest, we don't over rehearse. We really don't. We don't. We, I, I, that's why. Was, that's why we're rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, but well, I think that's what I, you, I, you I do that like jamming it. stuff. So you do that. The real. Yeah, I, I yeah. like it. I like it. I like it to be exciting. You know, on the night. Mm-hmm. If it, you know, we need. You obviously need to rehearse it. You know what you're doing, which right. we, we do. Um, but I don't like it being over rehearsed and perfect. I like right. it to have an element of. I'm not quite sure where it's going to go tonight, you know, because then it's exciting. And it yeah, it's a bit like Spinal Tap. If uh, you know, so my, my my bum notes are my trademark. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and every every time he comes off stage, our drummer Rich always says, "You left some great stuff out tonight, Pete." <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know, and I, I like that middle ground on that. Like I I was telling Deborah, I'm a big Miles Davis fan, and that whole idea oh, yeah. of where. You know, Miles was always into letting his guys take chances, and he knew that sometimes they wouldn't make it. Yeah. They might, they might blow it, but he would always have, rather have a guy that will go ahead and take the chance. 
Even if exactly. It, and he always says about Tony Williams, one of the greatest jazz drummers of all time. He would some if he didn't make it the first time, he'd try to get the next tune, and then he would make it. You know what I mean? He looked like like he was doing that. <laughs> but I, I like that with my in my own bands that I've had when I put my own together that we would we rehearse the house of the tune. Everybody knows where they're gonna go when the chorus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. But within yeah. that, if you want to try something, yeah. That's what we do. I think I think basically you all just learn the arrangement, you know, how many yeah, verses yeah. before a chorus, how many verses, and it, yeah. Once you, you learn know, the arrangement, then you work around that. We had the same, exactly the same conversation with Jimmy Page, didn't we? Now, there's, there's good little name drops. We had, we had lunch with Jimmy Page at his house one afternoon, and uh, he said he decides to talk about guitars and stuff and guitarists with me and stuff. Huh. And, uh, and he was saying exactly that same thing Miles Davis said. He said, you know, I'd much rather see hear somebody go for it and not make it and make a mistake, right. but trying to go for it. And as he said that, Debbie said, oh, you'd like Pete's playing then. I said, you'll love Pete's playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah, I know you told me off. I got told off about I it. Jimmy just looked at me and said, that, was, what did he say, cheeky or something? Yeah. <laughs> kind, of, kind of a compliment, I guess. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, a year, a year later, Zeppelin. A year later, sorry, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. A year later, he did come and see us. He came to the oh, Free Spirit right. concert at the Royal Albert Hall. So we were uh, so right, sort of in the off to the left. The VIP area was uh, like Brian May from Queen, uh, Jimmy Page. I didn't even and, look uh, up at that area. I got too scared. <laughs> I just looked everywhere else but that area. Yeah. All these spaces. Well, Led Zeppelin had so much jazz in them. I mean. Yeah, really, we were saying that John played really, he was playing jazz drums on a rock sounding kit. That's really what he was doing with that rock power. But he was doing those jazz licks and all of, you know, Jimmy Page's stuff that the tunes, they would morph those tunes all the time live. They never did it the same way twice. Yeah, and no. it, made, it made every experience a new experience. Yeah, which it needs to be. And it, yeah. it needs to be that, I think, for fans, but also for yourself because otherwise it just gets a bit boring if you're just doing right, the same right. thing and, and you, you're too scared to you know because I know bands where you know I know players in certain bands where they they've been told they cannot move it you know right. they've got to stay true to to the whole thing yeah and if they've got a click in their ears as well that they've all got to stick exactly. to and yeah. Yeah, got to, so we don't do, we don't do any of that you know, programming it's a bit difficult to we don't have any programming going on either because mainly as you can tell that we can't even work the computer with the zoom so trying to put any programming in that right, right, right. so well, it know, would be a complete disaster with, with, with technology and you know there's, there's always the yin and the yang like Record companies, a lot of times they're responsible for making the artists go out and just play the record every night, play the note for note, the record. But I'm happy that they're kind of dying because mm. real live music will come back where you go see a band and you're going to hear the tunes of the record, but you're going to hear a version you didn't know. Or yeah. Guys morphing into Purple Rain. I would have loved to have been there to hear that. Like, you know what I mean? That's. It makes you want to go see the band because if you're going to just play the record, well, I can do that here. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't need to, to drive and go somewhere to see that. I want, I want, I want to, and as a musician, I, I want to feel free to, Oh, maybe we could do something new with this. That's going to be really killer. And it makes yeah. it a concert unique. So that's my check. We, we do that. I mean, quite often in, in this song that Pete's talking about, um, I, I, I can just sing a, a lyric of a, another song um, like I've, I've, I'll sing a, a lyric of one of Free's Paul Rogers songs, and I can just sing it over, um, you know, our song, and then the guys pick up on it, and then we go, then we morph into that song. You know? Right, so, right, right. So, yeah. Anyway, so April 29th, the album comes out. Is going to be available on uh, Amazon and all those places, or what's what's going on? With yep. That? Yep. All platforms, right? Anything they can buy it anywhere. The download? Yes. Uh, yep. Any physical copies? Will you be selling CDs or any vinyl? With Phys like that? Physical, C physical CDs, definite. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we're hoping for a bit of vinyl eventually. All right. I'm a vinyl guy again now. So yeah. I, 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 want to put, I want to put this record on vinyl. Yeah, right. even, but it's uh, the, the record's actually, uh, is it 14 songs long? I think. 13. So. Thirteen, and it's it's too it's too long for a single album, 
So I was saying, uh, and then it's not quite long enough for a double album. So then I, I, real, I worked it out and we could actually do a double album at 45 RPM. And that, oh. is, that, and that is actually the optimum uh, hi-fi quality yes, for a record is. to be played at 45. And that's, what, that's why singles used to sound better than the album track. Right. Because it's uh, 45 yeah, RPM. The, the optimum speed. The yeah, yeah. So 45 RPM on a 12 inch record will give you 15 minutes per side. So there you go. So a double album at 45 RPM All will right. be one hour worth of music. So is that what we're doing then? I think or, so. or are you just talking tech? Because that's the only tech you know. <laughs> or, or we could do a double 10 inch album at 33. <laughs> Lordy. Oh. Anyway, yeah, it's definitely coming out on CD. And uh, we're hoping that it's going to be vinyl as well. Yeah, and if it's on vinyl, I want it in black. (laughs) (laughs) So it was really a good meeting you and, of course, talking to you, Deborah, about the new stuff. And, of course, one of my drumming heroes, John Bonham, that was wonderful that we we talked about him a little bit. I feel like, uh, you know, talking to you is the closest I'm ever going to get to actually meeting Mr. Bonham. So, uh, you know, (laughs) so, uh, you know, he'd be... Huh? I think he'd be quite knowing how John was. I think if he knew what his his legacy has been, and the amount of kids that have picked up the sticks because of him, I think he'd be completely overwhelmed because he was. I mean, you must if you ever you come to England, you've got to come and see the memorial that we did for him. Oh, we, oh yeah, we, we did a beautiful bronze memorial. Um, uh, that was myself and Pete and Robert. Uh, got he was with us on it. And it's it's absolutely beautiful, and we t- tied in raising the money for it. We we exceeded the, mo- the amount of money we needed by three times. Um, so we then made a huge donation to. We tied it in with Teenage Cancer Trust for kids with uh, teenagers with cancer. So it was uh, oh, great. the head the head guy of that is um, Roger Daltrey. Um, he's very much involved with uh, Teenage Cancer Trust. So. We did it with that, and um, it's beautiful. You, and you must come and if you ever, ever over here, to go and have a look at that. Yeah. I'm, look, I'm coming again. The, the tour's are coming back. I'm going to be positive about it. Uh, great again. meeting you, Pete. And I know you played with Jeff Beck. That's a great, great honor there. Again, to share the stage with that man. So, well, I, I actually, I actually played his gig one afternoon because uh, he didn't show up for sound check and. Uh, the uh, the tech had repaired a bunch of his stuff, and he says, "Hey Pete, would you check Jeff's gear out for me?" Wow, <laughs> so, there's wow. a big op- big open air auditorium, but one of those big sheds out there, you know, those uh, amphitheaters in America. So, at sort of four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm on Jeff Beck's white strap and through wow. all his marshals, and wow. I thought, well, I, I thought I better play some Ble- Jeff Beck tunes here, and I vaguely knew Beck's bolero. And I knew the solo from People Get Ready. I used to love that, the solo oh, that Jeff all right, did. All right. You know, it was that little bit of whammy bar that he'd do, and, you know, every fourth note or something. So I used to be able to play that. So I thought, oh, God, can I remember this? So I had to sort of try and remember it at, uh, you know, full volume in an open-air amphitheater stadium place. So it was like, <laughs> no forgiveness. And, you know, it wasn't quite right. And then I started laughing because I thought, Oh shit! There's about thirty thousand people queuing up outside, waiting to see Jeff Beck perform. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, <laughs> and I'm thinking, hang on, Jeff don't sound too good. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, that's funny. Well, that's, well, it's that's, lo- lovely a- to meet meet you, and thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for coming aboard. And in about ten days or so, you'll get your video, and you'll see it on YouTube. All right, thank Fantastic. you. And we'll share it. And we'll, get you some t- we'll get you some t shirt sales. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's- hoodies. I sell hoodies now, too. We got hoodies. That's oh, the- okay. <laughs> All right. oh, they're, they're, they're way too expensive. You, you need somebody that's got a job to afford a hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.